depending on who you ask, my backyard could be considered small, cramped, and definitely light polluted. I mean, I'm smack dab in the center of town. I've got street lights to deal with, neighbors wondering what the heck I'm doing, and my backyard skies are far from ideal for astrophotography. A class eight on the Bortle scale. That's really, really bad. So why wouldn't I just capture my images from a remote observatory? I could leverage the power of the modern day internet and connect to a $25,000 telescope under clear desert skies. A few clicks of the mouse and I'm capturing data from the comfort of my computer chair. That's way better than imaging here in my little light polluted backyard. Yeah, right. In this video, I'll break down every piece of gear I use step by step for a night of deep sky imaging here in the backyard. I'll explain how I use it to capture insanely beautiful images of objects in space from this little piece of paradise I call my backyard. I'll be setting up from scratch, covering each piece of equipment, what it does, and how I use it to capture images of space. This way you can replicate the process to take your own images if you're so inclined. I'll warn you right now, this is by no means the right way to go about deep sky astrophotography. It's just the way I do it. First things first, if you're brand new to deep sky astrophotography, here's the deal. I use an equatorial tracking mount to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. Because the night sky slowly moves throughout the night, you need to freeze it in place in order to take a long exposure photo. A long exposure image of say a minute or more will capture much more detail and color than your eye ever could. This data is collected by the camera sensor and then it can be processed to pull out even more detail and more color. I use a telescope like a camera lens because it gives me the focal length and the aperture needed to get up close and reveal the fine details of some deep sky objects in space. Deep sky astrophotography is all about collecting as much light as possible. It needs to be sharp, well exposed, and well framed. With good data, it's a lot of fun to do the next stage, which is post-processing you finally get to see the results of your efforts outside. For now, let's just focus on setting everything up properly to capture the best images of our target possible. There are links in the description for every piece of gear I use in this video. We need to power the equipment, so I'll run an extension cord or two out to my imaging location. Many people use a portable battery pack to power their gear, and so do I, when I don't have access to electricity. I bought one of those uh, car starter battery booster packs for convenience, but they don't last long and they're overpriced. The telescope mount sits on a tripod, or in this case, a tri-pier. A rock solid base for the tracking head of the mount is essential. It should be level and secure. Many people build a custom concrete pier and fasten their tracking mount to it. No matter what size of tripod you use for astrophotography, make sure that it won't slip or shift throughout the night. Most mounts have a built-in level, which comes in really handy. I adjust the legs of the tripod until the mount head is as level as possible. The mount I currently use is an Ioptron CEM60. It's a center balanced equatorial mount that uses a magnetic gear system. The mount lets me move the telescope in two axes and lets me point to any deep sky object I want in the sky as long as it's not obstructed by houses or trees. Once it's on the object, it will track it and keep it completely still so I can photograph it. This is a go-to mount, meaning I can punch in the target name and it will slew to it for me. What an age we live in. 
Polar alignment is absolutely crucial for a successful image. It may seem difficult to achieve at first, but it's really not that complicated. The reason I mention it at this stage is because we'll need to roughly have the mount polar aligned when I first set it up, meaning the counterweight shaft should be roughly pointing towards north. Because I'm in the northern hemisphere, I'll use Polaris, the north star, as a guide to properly polar align the mount. If you live in the southern hemisphere or can't see Polaris, there are alternative ways to polar align. Software assisted methods such as Drift Align can help. I've used a polar alignment routine in a software called SharpCat before and that worked extremely well. The way I do it is to use a simple app on my smartphone called Polar Finder. It tells me exactly where Polaris needs to be in my Polar Finder scope on the mount from my exact location. It uses my GPS coordinates and places the star in the correct position for my exact location and current time. It's just a matter of matching up what the app tells me in the Polar Finder scope on the mount. To match it up, you use the all to as adjustment bolts on the mount to actually move the mount head around. You're not moving the telescope, but the mount itself. The entire process only takes about two minutes once you get used to it. If you're not interested in doing this manual process or you can't see Polaris, you should probably check out the Pole Master. Now that I'm polar aligned, we can get to the fun part, mounting the telescope. Along with being polar aligned, balance is a major factor to consider when setting up your rig. The mount includes a counterweight, which I'll use to balance this 20 pound refractor telescope. You need to balance the telescope in both axes so that the mount doesn't have to work any harder than it needs to when slewing and tracking objects in the night sky. The telescope I'll be using tonight is the William Optics Fluorostar 132 triplet apochromatic refractor. This particular telescope has a focal length of 925 millimeters and an F ratio of F7. A telescope like this has enough aperture to pull in some serious light and get an up-close look at some of the most impressive deep sky nebulae. We need to attach the imaging payload, the camera, to the telescope before balancing. We also need to include the auto-guiding scope for an accurate overall weight to balance. I'll explain each of these items in a minute, but either way, this is the payload that will need to be tracking smoothly while the photos are being taken. Even the distance the focuser is from the tube will make a difference in the balance. So there may be some trial and error here. If I ever get around to writing my astrophotography how-to book, it will be called Trial and Error, My Painfully Humbling Journey into Astrophotography by Trevor Jones. There have never been so many great options for controlling your camera or mount remotely than there are now. Dedicated astrophotography computers, mini PCs, and good old-fashioned laptops. I've been using the same laptop since I started taking images of space back in 2011. This computer is used only for astrophotography and has spent more nights outside than any other laptop on Earth. I'm serious. Every clear night since 2011. This computer has software installed for controlling the camera, the mount, and of course an internet connection. I can remote into this laptop from in the house to check up on to see how things are doing. Now let's talk about the smaller telescope riding atop the big one. This is called a guide scope and its job is to help the mount track with even greater precision. I'll attach a small camera to this telescope which will feed a looping image of stars to my computer. Then, my computer will communicate with the mount and make small adjustments in periodic error for improved tracking accuracy. It sends tiny guide pulses to the mount based on the tiny movements it reads from the guide star. This is called auto-guiding, and it can be the difference between the ability to capture a 30 second exposure and a 10 minute exposure. For the upcoming task of star alignment, I'll use an eyepiece in this little telescope before attaching the camera. It's a 32 millimeter eyepiece that offers a wide field of view. This is beneficial for the next step of my process. With this mount, I first need to set the zero position with both axes in the home position. 
After that, I'll begin a simple star alignment routine, which calibrates the mount to have precise pointing accuracy. This means, when I punch in the deep sky object I want to image, I can be sure that the telescope will land on it and put it dead center in the frame. Certain objects are extremely dim, so it would be impossible to know if I have the telescope pointed at it without taking a series of test exposures. This can take precious time away from imaging on a clear night. So take the time to properly star align your mount first. I personally don't mind this stage of the process because I honestly enjoy a little time actually looking through the telescope and getting some minor physical activity. But I understand that there are those of you out there that are either tired of this process or have mobility issues. For those folks, use a plate solving software aid such as Astro Tortilla. It's free. The manual process of star alignment involves finding three stars and centering them first in the guide scope and then through the primary imaging telescope. Since I'll be pointing out some of the brightest stars in the sky, I like to perform my focus routine at the same time. I like to use the live view image from the camera during star alignment to help center the stars. Rather than centering the star in an eyepiece, I'll jump into my camera capture software to make this process easier and more precise. The software is called Astro Photography Tool, APT for short. A camera control software like this not only lets you automate the length of each image and the number of shots to take, but they also include features to help with focus, framing, and much more. A dedicated astronomy camera like the one I'll be using tonight does not include a display screen the way a DSLR does. This means that running an additional software tool to control the camera is necessary. To focus, I use a tool called a Batonoff mask that creates a star diffraction spike pattern on stars that are close to being focused. During my three star alignment routine, I roughly center the star in the wide field guide scope visually then I use the live view loop with the Batonoff mask to both center the star on the primary imaging scope and set my focus. What you're aiming for is a centralized spike between the X. With the star alignment and focus routine out of the way, we can now slew to our deep sky target and start imaging. Certain targets are better choices than others depending on your imaging conditions, moon phase, camera sensor size, telescope and filters, etc. Over time, you'll learn what your particular gear is best at and set yourself up for success whenever possible. The camera I'm using tonight is known as a one-shot color camera. It houses a CMOS sensor that shoots images in broadband true color, collecting light in RGB at the same time. A monochrome camera is capable of collecting more signal or light at once, but a filter wheel is needed to conveniently capture each color channel needed to produce a full color image. This camera is called the ZWO ASI 294MC Pro. That's a mouthful. It includes a cooling feature that keeps the internal sensor cool during long exposures. This is important because a hot sensor means more noise. Noise is the little pixels and artifacts that really mess up your image. With a cold sensor, you'll be able to create images with a much better signal to noise ratio. From my city backyard, filters are necessary to capture any sort of usable image. If I want to shoot a true color image with this camera, a light pollution filter will help ignore many of the wavelengths of light associated with things like street lights and porch lights. Even then, extensive processing must be done to separate the deep sky object from the bright sky in post-processing. It's the price we pay for being able to enjoy this incredible hobby from the comfort of our own backyard. Tonight I'll be shooting with a much stronger filter. It will ignore all wavelengths of visible light except for two very narrow band passes. The STC Astro Duo Narrowband Filter collects the light associated with hydrogen alpha and oxygen only. For certain emission nebulae, 
It can produce jaw-dropping images in even the heaviest of urban light pollution. With everything balanced, aligned, and ready to go, I can now hop into the camera control software to set up my imaging sequence. The target I've chosen to shoot is the Butterfly Nebula in Cygnus. It rises above my house by 10 p.m. and I'll track it along the sky until morning. I'll need to perform a meridian flip when the mount reaches the zenith, which just means that the telescope needs to switch sides and start tracking again. For narrowband images like the ones I'll be shooting tonight, you'll want to use longer exposures than you would when shooting in color. I'll tell the software to shoot 50 times 6 minute images. To make sure that each one of these 6 minute subs are sharp, I'll turn on the auto guiding system. For auto guiding, I use a free software called PHD2 Guiding. This tool runs my little guide camera, the Altair GP Cam 2, which houses a small mono sensor with one job to follow a single star all night long. The software will communicate with the mount to make the small adjustments needed for improved tracking accuracy. I can also leverage a feature called dithering, which reduces overall noise in your stacked image by slightly shifting the position between each frame before capturing. If you're brand new to astrophotography, I hope you now have a better idea of the process involved and what it takes to take a successful image of an object in space. It may seem like a lot to take in at once, and that's because it is. The good news is, if you're passionate and dedicated, all you'll need is small victories and improvements along the way to keep going and push forward. I certainly didn't get to where I am today in a hurry. Why would I rush through something I absolutely love doing? My final advice to you would be to be patient and enjoy every step of the way. The night sky is not going anywhere and you have the rest of your life to enjoy it. Thank you for watching and please subscribe for more tips and tutorials on the greatest hobby on earth, astrophotography.